Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So in the second lecture of um, the third module, we are going to continue the topic uh, from the first lecture, but with a special emphasis on the aspect of visual communication and the concept of communication uh, in a social purpose. Uh, so in our study, let us see how uh, the whole practice are connected socially. Uh, it is more like they are connected to the daily rituals. Uh, for different worships, uh, for the new harvest, for anything that is auspicious. So, we talked about transforming a common or general ordinary space into a special space that is what is connected to its context and how they are transforming that space to the ordinary space to a special space is by means of decoration. So, the paintings, they have some decorative qualities into it, the craft, the other modelings, they also have some decorative qualities to it, but they are just not mere decorations. So, when we call them the decorative art, they are not decorations for the sake of it. They are connected with the customary rites, the rituals and everything else, but uh, there is some uh, feeling of transferring it and make it auspicious that works as uh, the primary factor that uh, that was prevalent for it and uh, right now maybe it is not so much connected to the rituals and the customary uh, and habitual uh, behavior rather they are working as a style. So, if the style in the beginning were decorative it has to have some decorative qualities. Uh, to maintain the identity of that particular genre. So, when we see that there are decorations in that uh, tradition, uh, which is also leaving as a leaving tradition in contemporary uh, mode, uh, we feel that the decorative quality is still giving us some uh, identity of its own. Uh, however, like in the society, they had certain role to be played uh, throughout, uh, which is not uh, so important anymore. There are alternative mediums uh, and there is a paradigm shift because uh, if we look back and look at the basic purpose of this kind of practices, then what we can understand is that uh, it was part of a performance. Most of the time it was connected, uh, the, the kind of art that got generated, they were connected with some ritualistic performances and uh, it was connected to the temple traditions where uh, most of the things were meant or um, prepared for the purpose of the temples and there had been roving minstrels, the uh, Kathaks or the priests uh, who were uh, the basic uh, guides to make the painters work on it. So, most of the time the painters would work on all those backdrops or uh, the images that was used as the pitch y or the backdrop paintings in a temple as a, a backdrop or some, of some idol. And later those who are not able to visit the temple, uh, they can carry those images to the uh, general households and uh, tell the stories of uh, the epics and uh, all auspicious um, uh, happenings, uh, even that included some fables, folk tales, and uh, also some stories were connected uh, to uh, moral aspects only to educate people. There had been um, uh, tendencies to generate moral values, to propagate certain uh, theories. It was all uh, meant for some purposes for social communication for a very long time. And it involved a lot of things together. It was a complete expression. It was not only painting or making some images, uh, but rather it came with uh, some orations, some stories, 
some dance and performances. It also uh, needed uh, for um, the ambience to enhance the ambience by uh, choosing a particular time of the day to uh, do all these things. Uh, so, it was all connected to the performance and the rites as such. So, that way it played a very vital role into the society uh, to keep them engaged in their uh, extra hour. So, it was not only entertainment, but enrichment uh, in their leisures and was part of their uh, daily rituals in that way. But right now, it got uh, replaced by many other modes of recreation. And also because of the cross media and the cross cultural exchanges, uh, the expression of folk art took its own turn. It has changed. It has come with a new face rather. So uh, that way the communication aspect of folk art uh, has reduced to a different level. And we see it that there are certain things which are also uh, communicative, but uh, they are basically uh, having some emphasis on the visual communication. It is a visual storytelling that takes place even when it is a eka chitra or a single framed picture that is made uh, in the uh, like when um, we see that that it is made uh, I like it may not be made by a painter who belong to a painter's family, but those who are practicing or picking up those uh, uh, artworks uh, to emphasize on the style and technique of it. So, uh, their expressions as artists are getting conveyed through this medium, uh, which is working as a genre or a visual style of its own. And that is the interesting factor that we see that from the social communication to it is getting a very different outlook, uh, but everything is connected to the society and culture at the end of it. The painters over ages have been performing the role of a reformer by promoting the flare of rectitude in the minds of the common populace, not as a preacher, but entertainer with the artistic ability of painting and singing. Uh, in 2007, Shakuntala Ramani writes, uh, the meaning of art is similarly a mystic experience for which one needs Divya Chakshu, the inner perception. For understanding Indian traditional art or for that matter any art form, one needs a divine vision to understand the message of the artist beyond the outer image in the inner is the inner meaning which can be perceived and shared both by the artist and the viewer. It is by vision, the shared experience that reveals the soul of art. But in many instances, what we see now that the art is losing its soul. So, it is very important that uh, regardless of all its purposes, the soul has to be preserved in the artistic expression. So, if we uh, restrict the artist to um, paint for some social causes, it may also uh, undergo some kind of a uh, predicament. There are dangers that uh, these people may feel restricted. So, it is uh, another duty from us to see that uh, the artist remains free and then only the soul of the art can be maintained. Let us understand quite a few uh, such happening with some artistic expression of the contemporary time which are religious and traditional in nature. At the same time, the artist is using a lot of artistic freedom into it. They are the innovators, they are innovating new stories and seeing things from a traditional perspective, but uh, in a very uh, innovative and new term. So, these are the kind of dream, dream projects that they are taking up and uh, showing a different level of uh, understanding through their artworks. Uh, so, let us see some images and try to understand that. Let me show you the documentation that I have done uh, of 
one uh, painting made by Shilpaguru Anant Maharana of Raghurajpur, Odisha. Uh, that is uh, seen in the picture are almost in the finishing state. Uh, they needed a bit of a touch up to complete it. Uh, so it was just kept on the floor and uh, we'll try to look at them, uh, look at the image and understand how the communication uh, through some images uh, were done in social purpose and uh, now uh, and even then it was not only meant for a propagation or anything but the artist also took a lot of artistic freedom uh, in its execution. So this aptitude for centralization is not limited to the standalone symmetrical composition. In this image of Ramayana, inscribed on the body of Hanumana that is shown in the picture painted uh, by as I said Shilpaguru uh, Anand Maharana in Raghurajpur, Odisha. One can observe as uh, it has been pointed out to the author by the artist's son uh, Bibhu Maharana that uh, all happy episodes are put on the face of Hanumana while the episodes related to Ravana uh, the anti-hero of the epic uh, are drawn around the lower body of the Hanuman. Uh, the composition evoked uh, a certain integrity uh, such as images being governed by pre-formulated and preconceived solutions. The style here is uh, at its most expressive vibrancy. The considerable difference in the scale of Hanuman and the rest of the figures aged on his body uh, in the formation of a tattoo-like uh, formation together strike a, uh, so some kind of a increased and reduced uh, formation to formulate severally repeated with uh, a little variation here and there. Let us see more images uh, in detail from the same composition that will show us a uh, obvious bend towards the western Indian uh, influences that uh, they have in the folk paintings of Odisha for some obvious reasons that all these artists and their ancestors uh, they have come from the western India uh, from Rajasthan. They also have surnames as Maharana and Mahapatra. Uh, so, uh, they had some Western Indian cultural root that we may assume uh, right now. So, what we see here are different episodes of Ramayana. It is almost the whole Ramayana and the whole story that is depicted on the on some circular panels, circular form uh, fragments all over in the body of the central character which is Hanumana and let us see how they are uh, distributed through uh, throughout in uh, intricate and uh, very very uh, uh, congested uh, composition uh, which is full of details at the same time because of its general symmetry this asymmetries are getting supported by a symmetrical figure inside so we can actually look at them from its uh, symmetrical uh, emphasis at the same time, the narrative asymmetry and the use of allegory, symbols and narrations are very significant in this artwork. There are feelers in red linear pattern which gives us a intricate uh, formation of some pinkish, reddish, whitish uh, decorative motifs, uh, motifs in between. And according to the artist's son, uh, Bibhu Maharana, they are the veins and arteries of uh, Hanumana and uh, it shows that the blood that is flowing in the body uh, they are also auspicious with some auspicious motives. So, he is the iconic great god uh, who is the bhak, the worshipper, uh, who is uh, the symbol of uh, the person who is uh, like carrying the whole story of Ramana in his body. Let us see some other details. So, mostly the demon, the Ravana and other demons, they are in the lower part of the body and uh, what we see in the center of the body are the happiest sins, especially the face has the happy events. 
so in the middle part in the chest what we see that he has um, taken out the inner part to show that uh, rama and sita the uh, main characters they are sitting at uh, his own heart and that is uh, the kind of um, place where they are sitting uh, is a lotus and the lotus motif is getting continued as his vein all throughout. He is also wearing uh, rings and there are uh, formations of the typographic formations in many different places which are working. Uh, as typographic motifs throughout. All the frames are circular. And the face, what we see that uh, these are the happy episodes uh, that has taken place from the story, from the narrative. That the face of Hanumana and even in the eyes, in the uh, iris, the eyeball, it has the images of Vishnu uh, and as we know Rama, the central figure is the incarnation of Vishnu. In the border, there are the same deity Hanuman in different dancing gestures throughout that provides a lot of variation. So, it is not just the decoration, but the kind of artistic expression and observation that is shown here is of a uh, high quality um, stuff. Let us see another example from the Manisha Mangal Patachitra of early 20th century Bengal. Uh, that is an example of a medieval narrative based on the popular Mangal Kavya tradition of Eastern India. It is probably uh, archetypical of the Middle Ages where the painter could afford to depend on the viewer's ability to recognize the characters on the basis of the attributes that uh, accompanies it. For Manasa Mangal Kavya, the character of Manasa, the vindictive snake goddess, uh, who is also not as important as the known goddesses, uh, can be identified with a snake accompanying her in this picture. Uh, Manasa Mangal Patachitra from Midnapur in Guru Sadhadat Museum collection collection number 182 uh, is uh, 8 feet by 1 feet 4.5 inches uh, in size made in 20th century uh, with entire story told here in 12 panels. It is important to observe that the storytelling and folk narrative paintings have some basic difference with the animation and graphic novel. The difference is most obvious in the storytelling of planning of a sequence where the repetitive movement is involved. In graphic novel, the idea of the happening is uh, fragmented into many parts to pick up the most effective friends and the key friends to depict the active motion. In Patachitra, the stories are popular and already known, causing the actions rather frozen 
with no obvious climax as uh, it has some emphasis on the narrative quality of the visual. The most active frames are merged in continuous flow. Animations on the other hand are built up with fragments of effective dialogues and moving actions on frequent visual uh, push and pulls in the composition. But they have some similarity in their characteristic and uh, if at all the uh, language of Patachitra has to change then the shift of paradigm should also happen, can only happen in the form of uh, graphic novel making. Uh, so, however, in this picture we would like to see all the frames that are there, uh, all the 12 panels uh, that are documented and we will try to understand the story through it. So, in the first frame we see goddess Manasa who is a snake goddess appearing in the picture with a snake uh, which is in a spiral order and uh, uh, quite a large one. Then in the next frame which is continuous uh, and it is also shown at the lower part of this particular frame. Uh, I show that in the individual image in a zoomed in condition where a group of Kirtaniya or the roving singer devotees, uh, they are singing and playing drums and there is a character known Chad Sadagar and his family, uh, the main character uh, who refused to worship Manasa because she was the unimportant goddess and he was the worshipper of Shiva and he is the character uh, who uh, sacrificed because of his uh, determination and the story is built it up with this uh, rivalry between Chad Sadagar and Manasa. So, we see Chad Sadagar and his family and the marriage procession of Behula and Lakshinder. Uh, they are the Behula and Lakhinder. Uh, Lakhinder is the youngest son of Chad Sadagar uh, and uh, he is getting married. Uh, in the third frame, what we see is Chad Sadagar, the largest figure with the wife and the other family members and then the marriage of Behula and Lakhinder. Uh, before that, what happened that all the other sons of Chad Sadagar uh, was uh, they were died already in snake bites uh, as Chad Sadagar refused to worship Manasa. Uh, so, there was a curse in the family and then in the next panel what we see that the marriage procession of Behula and Lakhinder were the black snake biting Lakhinder. Behula with the dead body of her husband Lakhinder floating on a bhala. And at the right side, Behula uh, detailed at Goda left Behula near Ghat of Apu. Behula before Neta in the guise of a tiger. Behula before Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in heaven. Chad Sadagar, his wife Sanaka. Behula and Lakhinder lying and the river flowing and Behula is carrying the dead body of his newlywed husband uh, to the heaven uh, through the uh, river uh, path and Neta is the washer uh, lady. Uh, who is washing the clothes in one of the uh, ghat uh, thereby. So, Chan Sadagar, his wife Sanaka and seven sons of Chan Sadagar comes into life at the end frame where uh, the gods are pleased by Behula and there is a goat sacrifice before goddess Manasa that uh, took place. So, we see the goat sacrifice before Manasa, Manasa is pleased by Behula's gestures and finally uh, the shipwrecks that took place as a curse 
uh, that um, is recovered and all the sons of Chad Sadaka they came into life at the end of it. So uh, the stories are made and written for purely social purposes to inject fears, fantasies uh, related to new gods and goddesses who came into the scene in the medieval uh, Bengal as well as uh, in the country uh, uh, in that particular time. So they wanted uh, this kind of fears to be um, inserted into the common mind that uh, to popularize certain worships of uh, the unimportant or the secondary important uh, gods and goddesses in that time. So there are stories related to that and there are amazing uh, narratives, the literatures which were um, written in that uh, age uh, on the basis of the stories for regular oration. It was part of the ritualistic um, tradition where there had been uh, the part and puja means the reading of those texts with the images and also um, the worships with some ritualistic customary rites that took place in the society uh, and that was meant for public gathering that uh, there would be people from different uh, households who would meet at some point and read the story together and get uh, the moral out of it uh, and then to uh, remember that for a very long time there had been also occasions when the Patachitrikars uh, carried their painted scrolls and also sang parallel songs with the same episodes. The present day study in the context of folk art as an indication towards the perception of viewing and appreciating artworks to connect the comprehensive art critic. Uh, the artworks created by this artist not educated uh, in academic style in urban art schools also uh, who inherit the skill and carry it through the generations may seem to contain elements in them that are ageless and primitive or could even be crude or amateurish. They are far beyond the responsibilities of the representational norms of realism and naturalism and can be totally idealistic and simplified in nature. But folk art begins a community practice uh, almost every uh, to, to its uh, inhabitants of the cluster uh, has certain level of skills but only a few qualify to be the master. The rest of the people perform as followers to contribute to the process as skilled craftsmen. So here we should also uh, realize a very crucial point that when we look at the practice as a community practice, we must also know that not everybody in the community is masterminding a style of expression through their art, but everybody is familiar with that skill set and uh, most of the people can participate in this kind of a creation. So it is a group activity uh, with no doubt, but there are only a few heads who can be identified as the mastermind for this creation. The other people are just the skilled laborers who would uh, learn the thing from them and contribute as apprentice and later they may master the skill, but it is not necessary that all of them uh, can master the skill and think innovatively. So, in a way, uh, we should also know that it is part of the society where everybody is familiar with a language and this is also the cultural context that we discussed in our previous lecture that makes it uh, more effective as a mode of communication in a confined society and then the aesthetic value of it goes beyond it and becomes universal.